It's good to see everyone out this evening. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> I want to begin by looking at a, just a simple passage, a very interesting passage, and we'll see why in just a moment, but Ephesians chapter 4. Before we get into the text tonight, I would just say, um, just repeating the, the words of Cody earlier, make sure that uh, we got a new month very quickly approaching, and so make sure that those uh, Bible classes are filled. Um, and let's try to make that a goal. Let's try to make that uh, accomplish that by the end of tonight. So let's make let's make sure that by by tonight we get all of those slots filled for the next month, and make sure that we're preparing for those uh, appropriately. Um, like I said, if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter four, there is a passage here that I think is very uh, maybe peculiar to some. Very interesting when you read through it. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 26. These are the words of the Holy Spirit. And it says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil, devil an opportunity. Again, I think this passage is interesting because uh, a lot of times when we talk about anger, the default is, you know, just don't be angry. Don't be an angry person. And I don't think Christians should be angry people. But here is a command where it does say that we need to be angry. And so if that's the case, we need to figure out what that means. If we want to be uh, obeying this the way God wants us to, what does it mean to be angry? What does he want us to be angry about? And then I just want to look at the, just very, very simply that next uh, uh, point, don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. And, you know, I think just from the very outset, the, the quick and easy answer is how do we balance these things? How do we do this appropriately, rightly? Look at the example of God and try to be more like him. I think that is the answer. And so if you go away with anything, at the very least, make sure that we think about the example of God and try to act more like him when it comes to uh, anger and how we are to, to balance these things. So first, I just want to look at what are we supposed to be angry about? There is such a thing as righteous anger. Um, you, you know, honestly, even Jesus got angry. Over in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Look at what it says about Jesus' emotions in Mark chapter 3. In verse 1 it says, Now in those days, John the Baptist came. This, this is actually Matthew. Matthew. Uh, this, this, Mark chapter 3, not Matthew chapter 3. I could tell immediately that wasn't the right passage. He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And so already you see not a very good uh, start to the emotions of these people that were watching Jesus. So in verse 3, he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. He said to them, that is the ones who had the bad hearts, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And so just immediately you, you find that here is a moment where just in, in the average day of Jesus, as he's teaching, there's anger. Now, I don't think any one of us would look at the anger of Jesus and say that that's sinful. Clearly it's not. But there is such a thing as righteous anger, as we've already said. And we need, to, we need to ultimately, I think, as we're trying to compare ourselves to the example of God, we need to try and emulate that same anger. So what does, what does God get angry about? What makes God angry? And therefore, that helps us understand what we should appropriately be angry about. Over in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, in verse 18... Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And then skipping down to verse 32 at the very end of the chapter, And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And so, just from the beginning, we find that God does get angry at things. And, and not only that, but we even see the things that he gets upset about. And what is it? All ungodliness. 
And as you, you could just read through the, the, the whole passage here in Romans chapter 1, we don't have the time for that this evening, but what you see is just a, not even an exhaustive list, just a, a list of examples of the kind of ungodliness he's talking about that makes him angry. The kind of ungodliness that he says, I am storing up my wrath for this one day in the judgment. And, and you get to the very end of the chapter, and he says, not only are they doing the same, but also give hearty approval. I think that is a very interesting phrase there, to give hearty approval to that kind of sin. I wonder, do we, I think it's so easy to not get angry with some things that God gets angry about, because a lot of the time it's very subtle. How can we give hearty approval today? When you're watching TV and you see, maybe it's a sketch of some sort or some you know, episode on our favorite show or just a movie, what we find is people mocking God. Do we laugh along? When people are making fun of the story of the Bible, do we think that's funny? Or do we get angry with righteous anger? Does that upset us appropriately? Or maybe you see, and it doesn't have to just be that, but you see on TV all kinds of things. People just incessantly cursing, and they, that's all that comes out of their mouth. Do we laugh? Or again, are we, are we angry about that? We need to make sure that we are not overlooking the easier, the more subtle temptations that the devil likes to give to us. Because especially when it comes to the television, especially when it comes to the things that we stream, it happens a lot more than often that we see ungodliness. And a lot more than not, we tend to not recognize those moments where we ought to get angry at sin, at ungodliness, the things that make God, the things that he says he is storing up his wrath for. And so there is such a thing as righteous anger. But not only that, when you look at this command to be angry, I think this also means that we don't ignore godly consequences. Now, what do I mean by that? Over in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 10 the Hebrew writer here is, is kind of hearkening back to really the, the generation in the wandering in the wilderness, that generation that did not go into the promised land, and so they were, uh, they were subject to the wander in the wilderness for 40 years. He's talking about this, and in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then you go down to verse 17 as he continues to kind of talk about this example. It says, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Now, look at that. It says angry with for 40 years. Again, I don't think that God ever uh, is angry in a sinful way. But what we see is that righteous anger, it does not just overlook sin. It doesn't overlook the things that God says cannot be overlooked. And so what's a good example of that? I think very easily, God says time and time again throughout the New Testament, you need to confront sin in the church. You need to confront sin in the church. Now, when God says that, especially as emphatically as he does, are we allowed to ignore that? Are we allowed to see a passage like Matthew chapter 18 where there is public sin? Are we allowed to just act like, you know, well, everything's fine? No, we are not allowed to do that. Now, certainly, I think that this is much easier, uh, and I think we do this a lot more often with the more heinous sins, the more outright, like adultery. That's a pretty big one, and it's, it's pretty easy to act on that. But what about, again, the subtler ones? What about the ones that we deem as maybe smaller, especially compared to you know, something like murder or adultery? Let me ask, could we overlook a Christian who is going around gossiping about brethren? Are we going to just remain idle, or are we going to be righteously angry about that? Are we allowed to overlook the Christian who refuses to worship God in the assembly? Is that, should that not really, uh, should that not stir up our hearts and stir up our souls and our zeal? Something's not happening that should be. Someone is not worshiping God when they should be. God is not getting all of the glory that he should be. That's something that should make us angry. And so when we talk about righteous anger, we talk about the things specifically that are, are not bringing glory to God. In fact, may, may uh, be bringing shame to his name, shame to his people. We need to make sure that we get angry about these things. Because this is the command. Be angry, but with a righteous anger. 
Now, finally, as we talk about these consequences that I think you find scriptural consequences, I would just say maintaining these consequences does not mean that it is unloving, that we are unloving. And I would just stress God's consequences, not our own. But we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But we need to maintain these things. We need to hold on to them. And, and, and sometimes people would say, because there is consequence to sin, and we are not going to ignore those consequences, people would look at us and they'd say, well, how dare you? You're just not loving enough. You, you, just, you guys just don't love anybody because all you're, all you're wanting to do is just shame people and, and just make sure that they never get another chance. Well, honestly, that's, that's not the goal ever, obviously. That's clearly not the goal. But it's not fair to say, and I would say it, it's, it's quite... Uh, it's quite ridiculous to even remotely suggest that it is unloving. Because if that's the case, if you suggest that, does that mean that this is true of God? He was angry with that generation for 40 years, and he said, this generation will die out. They will not be able to see the promised land. Does that mean that God was sinfully angry? No, no one would even dare suggest that. And so it's not unloving just because we are holding on to consequences God says needs to be maintained. It's actually very loving. And we're going to see this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is, I think, a really good example of this. But before we even get there, let me just say, if it is, if it is loving to maintain these godly consequences, I would say to ignore them is completely unloving. It is the very opposite of having that faithful love that we're supposed to have as we talked about this morning. Oh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 4, remember it's speaking about the brother, the Christian, who is sinning openly, unrepentantly. And so as, as he's talking about this brother who is engaged in sexual immorality and an egregious kind, it says in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, first of all, let me just ask, is that unloving? What is Paul saying we're doing this for? Because we want them to be saved. And so I... I, I would have a hard time someone trying to justify saying, no, this is so unloving. No, that's just simply not the case. Clearly, it's a loving thing to, to may, maybe have to go through some uncomfortable circumstances, to may have to confront. Con confrontation is never really comfortable. Well, almost, almost always uncomfortable. But the reason we do that, the reason we suffer through that is because, well, hopefully because we love our brother, not because we just want to put them down. We confront and we do this, and even we may have to withdraw our fellowship from those who have gone astray, those who are unfaithful. We may have to do that, even though it's uncomfortable, but because we love them. And I would just ask, when you look at this command that's given in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and even when you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, a similar command, speaking about those who go astray and are no longer faithful to our God, do you, can you really say that you love that brother if you're not willing to do this? If you're not willing to obey God, who says this is the best thing you can do for them, can you really say you love them? I don't think you can. What a, and you just take that a step further. Do you love God if you're not willing to do this for him? I think that those are the two main questions, really, as we were talking about this morning. You clearly don't love God enough if you're not willing to follow this command, and you clearly don't love your brother enough if you're not willing to do it. And again, I know that this is difficult at times. A lot of the time. But does that mean that we're just going to rid them, rob them of the best chance that they have? I'm not willing to do that. And so we need to be angry. We need to have a righteous anger. And what that means is there are going to be consequences that we need to hold on to. But remember, God's consequences, not ours. And so as we keep this in mind, we need to balance this out. Because, again, essentially when you see be angry, people immediately think, well, then I have full, you know, free reign to do it. That's not the case. There is still some balance that we need to have because God says, be angry, but sin not. But again, back in Ephesians chapter 4. Remember how that verse ends in Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> in verse 26. At the very end, he says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. So how do we balance this out? How do we make sure that we have this righteous anger, but don't go too far? Well, first of all, we can't hold on to anger, allowing it to just, to just grow more intense and really breed sinful behavior, sinful emotions. 
Anger in and of itself is not sinful, but because we just tend to not be that, not, not be that centered when we get angry, it tends to bring us to a sinful circumstance or it tends to bring us to sin, certain sinful actions. And so within this text, what we find is a part of that answer. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't just hold on to it with all of your, all of your bitterness and all of your hatred. You, our goal really is to get rid of it as quick as possible, if we can. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, you see that clearly. Over in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, you see, I think, a very similar instance. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Listen, just so far in the command... Many of us have already failed. And so we need to really pay attention to this because just from the outset, we need to do better. And then it goes on to say, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Let me ask you something. Have you ever said something that you probably shouldn't have said? I mean, I've been there several times. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering, offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are, at, while you are with them on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Now, all of that just to say, in each case, Ephesians chapter 4, Matthew chapter 5, what do you see? In both circumstances, the idea is to actively work to reconcile the issue, to, to get over the issue, to get past it. And the, the notion is not, well, you bear your grudge as long as humanly possible. If you bear a grudge, if you create a grudge from the anger, I, I would say that's, the, that's one of these sinful conclusions. We can't allow our anger to breed sin. That's when people go too far, is when they allow their anger to, to really control them instead of them controlling it. And that's when you see the sinful actions come forward. Now, I would just, I would ask, what if really I have been truly wronged? What about the moments where it's not just, you know, we each did something wrong? What if it's not just the moments where I did something wrong and really I need to make things right? But what if I really have been wronged? I, I am the innocent sufferer. What then? And really, I want to, make, I want to talk all, all throughout the rest of the, these points about what that should look like. If I am the innocent sufferer, does this mean that I get to react however I want? No, again, we are not going to allow anger to breed sin. It's got to be maintained. And we want to make sure that if we disperse any anger, if we act on anger, it's on righteous anger that we hold on to the things that God says we hold on to. But it is so easy, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, to allow that root of bitterness to spring up and to cause all kinds of chaos and wreak all kinds of havoc. So we need to desire to, to let it go as quick as possible. Not saying that we let go of the appropriate consequences. And really this brings us to the next point. We should desire forgiveness. But while we desire forgiveness, that doesn't mean we're going to forget what God has said needs to be held on to. I think this is one of the points of Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. What does God say? Seek while he may be found. Call on his name while he, may, he can be reached. You, what's the point? There is a disconnect here. There is a problem where they do not have proper fellowship, Israel and God. And so he is saying, you need to have fellowship with me again. He doesn't say, you don't have to seek because I'm just going to act like nothing ever happened, even though you're constantly sinning before me. He doesn't say, well, you know what? I know that you've sinned, but I'm just going to be here no matter what. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to save you either way, whether you repent or not. He doesn't say that. What he says over and over and over again, and this is what he says at the very beginning of Isaiah, in, in chapter 1 and verse 18, come, let us reason together. Even though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. But it's on a condition in verse 20. If you don't obey me, if you refuse to obey me, you're not going to reap that reward. You're not going to get that reward. If you keep on going the way you're going, guess what? The judgment's still coming. 
But what does God desire? He desires forgiveness all the way through. Now, again, that doesn't mean that he's just letting go of the consequences. They're still going to reap the, the judgment. They're still, Babylon is still going to come. Assyria is still going to come in, in, in the case for the northern kingdom. But he is still going to bring the judgment. But not immediately. He is always there hoping that they will return. And I would just ask, as we try to compare ourselves to God, do we desire forgiveness the way God does? I would say there are a couple different instances. Sometimes I think there are people who do desire the forgiveness, but what they think that means is that we are just going to forgive where God has not. And let me just suggest, I don't think you can. It's just like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, there was such pride. Oh, we're tolerating. Look what we're tolerating. It's such pride in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, look at what we've forgiven. Did God say you could forgive that? Did God say he was forgiven? No. And so you don't, that's not your place. You don't get to act like you're more forgiving than God, that you're more gracious than God. That, that is not your place, not your role. And so uh, you see this balance, I think, so well, especially with God. We need to desire forgiveness. But uh, let me just ask on the other side of that. What if there is a brother who has done wrong, they repent, but instead of you know, reconciling as soon as possible, we refuse to forgive them. We refuse to let that anger go. Let me just ask, do we desire forgiveness? Clearly not. What we desire more is for them to squirm, is for them to wiggle, and for them to know just how low they are in our opinion. Again, you, you just don't see that with God. And so there's a balance that's needed. We need to desire forgiveness. We need to desire reconciliation. But that never means we're just going to let things go as long as there's not repentance. But as soon as there re there's repentance, what are we going to do? We're going to act like the father in the parable of the prodigal son with open arms, just waiting, waiting. We don't want to be the older brother who says, forget all this celebration. We do not want to be the older brother. We want to be like God in that case. So we don't want to hold on to it. We want to let those feelings go so that they don't breed sin. We want to maintain those, those, uh, we, we want to maintain those spiritual consequences while desiring forgiveness. But I would say, uh, adding on to that, as we've kind of <laughs> talked about throughout the whole lesson, we want to make sure that these consequences are not our own creations, but rather God's words, rather God's consequences. Over in the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, I think this is such a good verse here. Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 22, there's so much that the Proverbs have, has to say about anger. It says, an angry man stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered man abounds in transgression. And so an angry man stirs up strife, not only that, but hot-tempered man, he abounds. He adds on to the sin that's already been committed. He adds on to an already bad situation. And this is what happens when we act on our own anger, when we act on our own consequences, not God's. Over in Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm, Psalm 37 in verse 8. It says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only, only to evil doing. God's anger, that leads to reconciliation. God's anger leads to a positive path. Our anger, our consequences, when we decide that we're just going to, to, to have, give our anger free reign for all of our decisions, it only makes things worse. From the wisdom of God to, to the cry of our worship throughout the Psalms, it makes that case over and over and over again. And so we don't want to just lash out whenever these feelings well up inside of us. We don't want to follow our own consequences because it will just make everything that much more wicked. It'll make the conclusion of the matter that much harder to get to. I mean, you know this if you've been married for any length of time. How many times have you gotten into an argument with your spouse and because you said something oh so witty but oh so snarky that it added like three hours of, of conversation to that argument? And then you get to the end of that three hours and, oh, what, was the, what were we even fighting about again? Oh, yeah, you burnt the toast. <laughs> you know what happens when we decide that we're going to make our own witty, our, our own witty snarky little comments, not, not the things that God would say, but the things that I want to say, makes things worse. It always makes things worse. <laughs> 
And so we need to be careful. We need to be so careful that we are not acting like the rest of the world in this, but acting like God's people. Now, finally, I would say, just coming back to that notion of maybe you have truly been wronged. Maybe you have tried everything that you can. You have gone to the brother. Maybe the brother has come to you, and you have tried to make things right. You've tried to reconcile. You've tried to reach forgiveness. But all else fails. What then? I think David makes it clear in Psalm 4. That's actually what Paul is quoting in Ephesians chapter 4, is the Psalm of David in Psalm chapter 4. And in the first five verses there, what you find is that David says, you know, tremble, but do not sin. And that word for tremble just means, you know, maybe even tremble, shake with anger, but don't you, don't you sin. Don't you lash out. And what does he say the consolation is in? What does he say the answer is? You just give your sacrifices to God. You focus on him. Maybe there is a case where we have done everything we can, but the other brother, we're the, maybe we are the innocent sufferer. The other brother just refuses to make any changes. The other brother refuses to, to try and reconcile. What then? You give it to God, very simply. Because that's the only thing we're left to do. Now, I would say the world, and even many Christians, would say, you know what, I've done everything I can to make things right, but they won't respond accordingly. They won't respond the way that they're supposed to. So, you know what, I get to hate them as much as I want now. Does that sound like Jesus? Does that sound like God all throughout the scriptures and just throughout the passages that we've looked at so far? No, we don't get to say, I get to hate them as much as I want and I get to treat them however I want. No, God says, you leave the door open. Over in Matthew chapter 5, very quickly. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 in verse 43. Matthew 5 in verse 43. <clears throat> As you get to the end of chapter 5, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So what did Jesus say? You act just like the rest of the world. That's easy to love who, who loves you, who, to love who treats you right, who treats you well. It's a lot harder to love those who hurt you and maybe even willfully so. But again, how do we get to respond? Do we get to act like the rest of the world? Do we get to treat them however our anger decides? We want to treat them. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're just going to attack them just the way they attacked me. No, what God says is you leave the door open. And why is that? Because what you consistently see is God left the door open all the time. In, in Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 3, there are so many different passages that you could look at when it comes to the anger of God. This is one of the most beautiful, I think. In Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 12, it says, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, again, speaking to, towards Israel, the northern kingdom, return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every, garden, uh, under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord. For I am a master to you, and I will make you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Here's one, I'm telling you, so many different examples where God has been betrayed. God has been the one that has been hurt, and oftentimes willfully so by his own people. And how does he respond? Not with immediate judgment, not with immediate outlash of, uh, with, with emotion, but rather with patience, and with long suffering really suffering long. If anyone ever had the right to immediately say, no more, I'm cutting it off, never again, it was God. But he bears their rebellion time and time again just to give them time to repent. And so as we look at the example of God when it comes to you know, righteous anger and how that should look, what I think you find over and over again is there's righteous anger is supposed to lead to forgiveness, to reconciliation, not retaliation. And God, even though he says judgment's going to come, what does he want? He wants people to come back to him. And so that's what I want to leave you with tonight. Are you angry 
Have you been angry for some time? Do you have the mindset right now, for whatever reason, that all you can think about is getting restitution for yourself? Let me just ask, before our pure, holy, and perfect God, would you want him to view you with that same level of, of justice? With that same level of vengeance is mine? No, rather, when we think about it in those terms, we only, only ever find ourselves as the beggar, asking Give me just more time. Please give me more mercy. And I think when we view it like that, that really would change our perspective. We are all in this state before him. So Christian, what you need to do is let go of your anger. And remember that you will be forgiven by the same standard that you forgive others. And if you're not willing to let go of your anger, guess what? You're going to suffer the wrath of God in the end. And that's not worth it. And let me just ask, is it really not enough? for that injustice, for that, maybe even at times righteous anger, is it not going to be good enough for it to be satisfied at the cross? It should be. And so maybe that's what you need to focus back on. But if you're not a Christian, God desires for you to escape that wrath. I mean, have you not seen that in all these passages over and over again? He does not want you to face that judgment. And so he gives you time with every single day, with every single breath. That's God giving you mercy. Are you going to waste that mercy tonight? Would you become a Christian this evening? If you're subject to the invitation of Christ by any means, please come forward. Let your need be made known as we stand and as we sing.